LBC 97.3. This is London's biggest conversation with Ian Dale, live from the Conservative Party Conference in Birmingham. It's 27 minutes to one here on LBC 97.3. Petri Hoskin will be joining you from one o'clock. Before then, we uh, have still got Mark Reckless with us. He's the Conservative MP for Rochester and Strood. In about, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes' time, we're going to subject him to our general knowledge test. Of course, last week, um, we, we had an MP on... And I'm trying to remember who it was now. All I remember is that he did really well. It was Gareth Thomas, wasn't it? The Labour MP for Harrow West. He's now joint top with Mike Gates. He got 33 points out of 50. So that is Mark's uh, task, to beat 33 points this week. We'll see how he does um, in about 10 minutes' time. Before then... Let's talk to John Walsh. Who is John Walsh, I hear you cry? He's the maker of the film Tory Boy. Um, that's been released on DVD this week, and John joins us. I think he's, he's in our studio in London. John, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ian. Now, um, you've, you've done this fly... On, I suppose it's a fly-on-the-wall documentary. It's a bit of a drama as, as well. You were the Conservative candidate in Middlesbrough in the 2010 election. Uh, yes. You took on Sir Stuart Bell. What gave you the idea of doing the film? Um, well, I suppose initially I, I was moving naturally from being a lifelong Labour voter to, to becoming a Conservative, I think. Um, and because I'm a filmmaker anyway, I sort of tend to um, sort of make short films about things I'm interested in. So this initially was going to be a short film about me becoming a, a candidate, replacing like a red tie for a blue tie, and it was going to be a 10-minute film. Um, when I got selected very fast, as it turns out, for a seat in the North East, um, I found that uh, there was actually quite a more interesting story in the North East than about me being a candidate. Um, and it was about the, the sitting MP, Sir Stuart Bell, who's been the Labour MP there for 30 years. So the film really became the story of, if you like, the North East and Sir Stuart Bell. And the, and the vehicle was me being a candidate. Well, we'll come on to the plot in, in a minute, but I'm always rather suspicious of people who switch from one party to another. <laughs> um, what, what made you make the switch? Um, two, two specific things, I think. You know, I, I've, I've always voted Labour, so partly... It's been in my, my branding and in my, my DNA. Um, so that's why I always was in Labour. And I always I felt slightly conflicted by that, that I've always grown up being expected to vote Labour because I've come from a working-class background. But the second and more precise um, sort of epiphany was I was making a documentary with Gordon Brown, who was the then Labour Prime Minister a few years ago, for something called the Prime Minister's Global Fellowship, which was a, a sort of an internal vanity project where the Prime Minister of the day sent lots of teenagers around the world on a gap year experience. Um, it didn't turn out to be a very positive experience for myself and my team. And being sort of inside um, the workings of, of a Labour government, even though in its dying days, it really turned me off. I think I was, I was on the turn, as they say anyway, and that sort of, <laughs> sort of finally pushed me. At the same time, I found myself nodding along to David Cameron when he spoke on television, and I was quite drawn in. So I think it's a, a Pied Piper effect. And when he opened up the list and said, look, you don't have to be a, a, an active politician, you don't even have to be a Conservative, Come and join us. We'll decide if it's a good fit with you, and we'll take it forward. And I kind of thought, well, let's let's do that as a litmus test. I downloaded you, the PDF. You, you, you did become very disillusioned, though, didn't you, towards the end? Um, in in the film in Tory Boy. Yeah. Um, well, I became disillusioned with part of the process because at the time, in that seat, I wasn't expected to win. So I was pretty much ignored by National Party, certainly, and really ignored by local party as well, which was which was quite disappointing. So. I also have a bit of a short fuse, which is um, no surprise to people who know me, but might be a surprise to people who don't see candidates sort of effing and blinding. Um, so, oh, no... I, I did a fair bit of that in my time, I, I can't can imagine you. it, Ian. Which well, is probably honestly. why we're both not in Parliament. <laughs> Possibly. A uh, la Labour candidate in Norfolk at the last election, I think, sort of turned against Gordon Brown almost as much as you did just before the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the election, which I, I thought was rather fun. He has that effect uh, on people. No, well, 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 indeed. Um, now... Just take us through the plot of the film. I mean, I say plot. I mean, it, as it's a documentary, it's a bit difficult to have a plot. But, it, I mean, it traces your career as a candidate from the, from the time that you were selected right through until the end of the election campaign. Yeah. There's some quite emotional moments in it. Anybody who's fought in an election, I think, will be re able to relate to a lot of what you went through. Because, effectively, you've got what um, a former party agent of my acquaintance called candidatitis, where it's all about you. It's all about me. And the, yes. the, the fact that you weren't getting support from other constituencies... Um, you couldn't quite understand, and yet from a party, party strategy point of view, it was quite clear why you weren't, because you were never going to win in a month of Sundays. 
Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I can, you can see it in the round when you watch the film. It's frustrating when you're on the ground spending so much of your own time, effort, and, of course, money. I spent, you know, upwards of £15,000. Um, but I think, you know, it almost became two separate lives up there. There was John, the candidate, in his smart suit, having meet the candidate sessions and, and reopening the surgeries that Stuart Bell abandoned 15 years ago. And then there was the other side of me following the story and so the, sort of the filmmaker side of me sort of clicked in for that. So I think making the film kept me sane during those six months that we were up in the North East. And I think in some ways that's been the, the payoff or the reward. I had no contacts with anyone in the Conservative Party before I stood as a candidate. And now two years on, I know quite a few Conservative MPs, um, you know, we've had a very flattering review written by Lord Ashcroft. Um, lots of people have come out and said, you know, you don't have to be a Conservative to enjoy this film, as you mm. said yourself, Ian. If you've been involved in politics at any level, at any party, then, you know, elements of my film reflect back. Well, I think if you want to see politics in the raw, um, it's a really good film to watch because it, do it does give you the highs and lows of an election campaign. Mark Reckless, you, you fought uh, 2005, 2010, did you do 2001? Uh, 2001 as well. So I mean, you've got much more experience than either John or, or I have. It is a very fraught time, isn't it, particularly in an election campaign, because the whole focus is on you. Your party, if you've got any sort of recalcitrant party members in your patch, they want to have a go at you in a, at a, in a, very, at a very opportune time. How, what, how do you, as a candidate, cope with all the pressures of an election campaign? I mean, I found it particularly fraught in 2000 2005, because my result was uh, was so close. We actually had uh, Bob Marshall Andrews, the sitting MP. He uh, conceded on the uh, the midnight midnight news, and then staged what I call a an Al Gore style retraction <laughs> later in the morning, and what he calls uh, a Lazarus like recovery. <laughs> uh, and I think even the the, the first John and I didn't have that. <laughs> no, but um, I, I sort of. You know, it was tough thinking you'd won for a bit uh, mm. and then finding out you, you lost, and that was concertina in quite a short period. Even the early editions, I think, of the Daily Telegraph the next day said early Conservative victories included Justine Greening and Putney and Mark Reckless in Medway. And I got probably, you know, a few dozen texts congratulating me, including one saying I should marry that bird from Putney. <laughs> <laughs> and you never got the chance to meet her until five years' time. Um, I, I guess one of the worst parts, certainly for me, was the, the next day. I mean, in a sense, it doesn't matter what the result is. It's such a feeling of deflation the next day. It feels as a, it's a bit like a post-holiday feeling, isn't it, John? Because yes. there's nothing there anymore. You are not the candidate anymore. You have no position at all. And yet you kind of feel you ought to be doing something. Um, well, I think it was slightly different for me because... I knew from the statistics that we weren't likely to win and that protected us as well from having to do lots of things maybe central office wanted us to do that we didn't have to. But we knew that we had another story to tell. So when May the 6th, 2010 finished for us, we knew that uh, a, a new chapter was starting, the story of what was going on in the North East that the, luckily for me, the London sort of media had, had ignored for 30 years. So when the story broke about the film and the consequences of what the MP wasn't doing, it's continued and continued. And we've had quite a lot of heavyweight support. I funded the film entirely myself, and yet we've had Fremantle, which is a major media company, come on board to put it onto DVD. We've had lots of interest from broadcasters. We've had cinema showings. Um, so even though the story is May 2010, mm -hmm. and the interest in it has just kept growing and growing. Let's talk a little bit about your opponent in that election, Sir Stuart Bell, without saying anything um, slanderous or libelous. Um, he's been in Parliament a, a long time. He's uh, one of, I suppose, the great and the good. I think he's a church commissioner, or, or was. Um, but part of the plot of your film is actually exposing what an absolutely useless constituency MP he was, or is. Well, yes. I mean, as, as we know, there's no job description for an MP, so once you turn up once to the House of Commons and give your maiden speech, you've pretty much completed the legal requirements. Um, in the case of Sir Stuart Bell, he doesn't hold constituency surgeries and hasn't for the last uh, 15 years. Also, interestingly, he doesn't have a constituency office. Um, that's, that's entirely separate to surgeries. And I went through the official record of Parliament to find that there's actually four Conservative MPs who don't have a constituency office, 11 Labour MPs, again, who don't have a constituency office, but all of those MPs hold regular surgeries. And by regular, I mean maybe two or three times a week and hold them in different places. So perhaps after church or after Friday prayers or go to people's homes. So they're not set in one place. The only member of Parliament who unfortunately has no constituency office nor holds constituency surgeries out of all 650 MPs is Sir Stuart Bell. So why do his constituents keep re-electing him? Ah, oh, well, that was something we found out in the film. 
Um, he keeps a very low profile, so people don't really know who the local MP is. Those who do know him repeat the story and say, look, he's not doing his best for the area. The newspapers called him Britain's laziest MP. Um, when he was challenged by Ed Miliband about this, of course, there was the usual sort of apologies in the paper and showing his face around the town, but he's, he's just not done anything at all. But in terms of statistics, he had a 32,000 majority, which he's whittled down to about an 8,000 majority, which is still incredibly healthy, and anyone would love an 8,000 majority. But it shows that the feeling in the town is that they're not being best served. And it's not a Labour or Conservative thing, it's just when you pay somebody to do the job. If I was employed here at LBC and didn't come in for 15 years, I wouldn't expect to still get my salary. Um, so it's that expectation, I think, has changed. And when we made Tory Boy, we made a short film to accompany the DVD called Tory Boy The Aftermath. And different MPs have come along, like um, Jesse Norman and Rob Halfen, to give their view on what they think. Um, not just the partisan view of, of, of being a Conservative is best than being a Labour. Um, but that view of what people expect from their MPs, and people do expect. I, much I more. suppose that um, different politicians have different ways of going about being a good constituency MP. There, as you say, there's no job description. Everybody does it in a different way. Um, Mark Reckless, I don't know if you know Sir Stuart Bell very well at all, but. I imagine a lot of your colleagues approach this in, in different ways. I mean, I remember Eric Forth, the late lamented Eric Forth, um, who died, uh, when was it, 2006, 2007, I think. He didn't hold any constituency surgeries in his constituency, yet he was actually a brilliant Conservative MP for his constituency. So it's not, it's not just about holding surgeries, is it? Mm. Um, yes, I, I, I agree. I mean, say to take my, my predecessor, Bob Marshall Andrews, as an example, compared to a lot of Labour MPs elected in, in 97. I mean, he didn't do a sort of huge number of uh, surgeries or you know, really vi visit the constituency that uh, that frequently. But you know, he had a, a strong media profile, and you know, he put his put his principles before the the, the requirements of the of the party whips. But I, but I found you know a lot of people weren't necessarily aware of uh, some of what he was doing, and simply by spending a, a huge amount of time going around door to door, doing uh, sort of deliveries, doing doing surgeries, m meeting people. In my case, taking over a year of work to campaign full time. You really can make an impact, and you know if, if other constituencies had had the same swing I did in in 2001 and then 2005, then we'd have got rid of mm. uh, Tony Blair. I, Tony Blair back then, and had, I, had a landslide this time. I can remember um, thinking when your your constituency came up for selection in two thousand. When was it? 2008, 2009, whenever it was. And I remember sort of you had a really good reputation as being a candidate for getting around the constituency. So uh, people kept saying, "Oh, you should apply for that one." I thought, "Well, what's the point? They've got somebody who's well known in the." local area he's going to get it anyway so i thought i, w I won't bother maybe, maybe i should have done other then it could have been you sitting here and me sitting there mm. i mean i remember your, your campaign <laughs> in north, north norfolk and certainly yeah. in terms of your, your online presence i think it yeah, was an of, exa example of good that did me um john john walsh just finally and where can people get hold of your dvd if they want to buy it um they can get it now on amazon it's called tory boy the movie um, I'd just like to take one very quick point for me, Ian. The other MPs mm. you spoke about who do work hard in other areas, journalists who saw my film decided to take it to task to see if it was propaganda. One journalist rang him 100 times over 100 days, <laughs> left messages, <laughs> and he never returned any of those calls. And the inside story about the Labour newspaper, the Northern Gazette, who broke that story, is all in the DVD extras. Well... Um, I have seen the film, and it is well worth watching. Um, do uh, go and buy it uh, from Amazon, or indeed from any other online uh, retailer, or indeed in, a, in Break the Habit of a Lifetime, actually buy it in a shop. Uh, there you go. John Walsh, thank you very much indeed. Mark Reckless is staying with us. He's going to be taking our general knowledge test in just a few minutes' time. It's 12.47.